that's a good, you know, transition now to kind of talk about the national meet and yeah. give a little, provide a little bit more context and background as to, you know, Tifers and the adjustments and, um, you know, he's been vocal about it on Twitter. He is the head coach at Emory coach Ling. Welcome to the double. Hey guys. How's it going coach? Good. Thanks for joining us. We're excited to have you back in D3 as you were a Lynchburg grad. And then you took a little D1 route for a little bit. Um, but yeah, what's it like to be back in D3? It's good. You know, I mean, I was a D3 athlete, but um, until I got to Emory, my entire coaching career was Division One. So, um, you know, you you just have totally different perspectives depending on on where you're standing, if you're an athlete or a coach. And so, um, you know, there's things I'm seeing as a coach that I didn't see as an athlete and, and vice versa. And so, um, yeah, it's just cool to be back. Yeah. And what are some of those things, some of the differences that you've seen um, between D1 and D3 and that kind of transition? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's funny because people ask me all the time, like, well, what's the difference? Like, what's the big yeah. difference between D1 and D3? And, you know, the, the big difference is quite obviously scholarships, right? Like that's, oh. that's the big difference. Um, other than that, you know, as far as coaching, I don't think there's a whole lot of difference. You know, I, I, I mean, you know, you don't coach kids differently in division one than you do in division three, you know, you're not using different workouts or, or, you know, race tactics or anything like that. I mean, track and field is track and field. Right. And so um, I, I think it, the interesting thing to me is I, I feel like both groups are very protective of their division, right? So a, a, a D1 coach with a history in D3, like you hear all this stuff, you know, kind of the stereotypical, like, you know, uh, baby nationals types of things being said. And then, you know, when you're in D3, you hear people being very protective of D3 and, you know, and rightfully so, right? Like trying to constantly trying to prove like D3 is good. And um, I don't know, I just, I guess for me, I never really thought about it that much. Like what's the difference, you know? I like that. If you can coach, you can coach, right? It doesn't matter who you're, yeah. who you're coaching. Yeah. And you know, I mean, you look around the landscape and I mean, I, I guess when you're talking coaching that that's one thing that could be like, um, I hope nobody gets mad at me for this, but like, you know, there's the, I, when I first got in, into coaching, there was this guy who I met who um, we were at a, um, level two school together. And, you know, he'd been in it for a while at, at a lot, really at the high level. And he's like, you know, there's a lot of coaches that can essentially shop for the groceries, but can't cook the dinner. And, um, you know, there's some that, you know, vice versa, but some of them don't need to be able to cook the dinner. They only need to be able to shop for the groceries. And so, you know, I think there is some of that in D1 and, and you know, at, uh, at the expense of maybe some former some former colleagues getting mad at me um, <laughs> but i think you know you look around d3 and at least i do and i see some of the best coaches in the country um regardless of division right that some of the things that some of these people are doing in division three with the types of athletes that they're getting out of high school is just like it's unbelievable yeah before we kind of talk about emory one cool stat about you is that you coached paul chalimo in uh, unc greensboro Obviously, he was a good college athlete, but did you see this potential and what he's accomplishing now? Yeah, I, actually, I did. Yeah, and and you know, it's interesting because uh, so he was at an NAIA school and um, and then transferred to Greensboro, and uh, you know, the first well, his first cross country meet was a little bit of an eye opener because I you know I told the the group to run together. I'm like, just run together for a few miles, whatever, and he just like took off, and I'm like. All right. Um, and, and then we went to, uh, we went to Paul short that year, the first year. And that was the year that Oklahoma was really good. I think they come in, come in ranked seventh or something like that. And they had a bunch of all Americans. And, um, this guy goes out in four twenty five for the first mile and he's just way out in front of everybody. <laughs> everybody, you know, Paul short, that first mile it's packed with people. It's lined with yeah. spectators. You know? And so I'm there and all these people are just like murmuring. Cause you can see them way down. And I'm just like, oh no, what's going on? And, and he comes through 5K. I forget what he was. 5K. It was low, mid 14s, just way out in front of everybody. And he and I'm like, all right, just you know, just stay chill, whatever. And he just he's just like, <laughs> and I was like, that I was like, all right, I got I got a little bit of a beast on my hands here. And um, you know, we used to talk a lot about like things he wanted to accomplish, and 
you know, the first thing that Paul told me was that like, he wanted to get a 4 because he didn't want to be seen as just an athlete. He wanted to be a student and um, he wanted people to recognize that. So I really respected that about him. But then, you know, he was like, I want to be a professional athlete. And, and so, you know, I tried to do everything I could to help that happen. Like, you know, we weren't doubling and tripling him at conference. I mean, the kid could have won everything in our conference meet that he raced, but usually we'd run him in one event. Um, we try to focus on, you know, going to nationals and getting quality experience, putting them in meets at Stanford, stuff like that. But, you know, I told him his sophomore year, I'm like, Paul, you're, you know, you're a sub 13 guy for sure. We just got to make sure that you stay healthy and you progress, um, at the proper rate. And so, um, you know, he, he would do some things that in practice that I'd be like, Oh, all right, <laughs> this guy's good. You know, yeah, that's cool. And the mentality, he just, you know, he just has the mentality that that's it. So. That's awesome. And I think that that's cool to hear you saying too, like it's, it's no different. Like you're, you've coached a guy like Paul Chalimo and now you're coaching D3 guys and you're like, like you can, you can clearly coach. That's uh, yeah. that's awesome. <laughs> yeah. So congrats it, for that. It sucks a little bit to know that like you've probably had your best athlete ever yeah. kind of early in your career, but um, you know, it, it's just fun. And Paul and I, you know, we keep in touch and we're close and, um, you know, I've just become his biggest fan, I think. So, um, I, I love the guy he's, his personality is so unique and, and he's so, so funny. funny. Um, so yeah, I, I could probably write a book of Paul Chalimo. <laughs> stories, so. Please do. Please do. The world needs that book. <laughs> <laughs> What's his go-to saying? Um, he like, puts on Twitter. Suffer the rest go of hard your life. Yeah, the rest yeah, of your yeah life. exactly. Yeah. yeah. The funny thing is he, you know, no, he wanted to run the sequel in college. And, oh, uh, and he used to bug me to run the steeple and, you know, he had a little bit of, uh, it band issues at one year and we were, we were going to run the steeple that year. And then we backed off, uh, because of it band. And then, um, I remember going to, um, going to the Mayo invite with him one year, him and Paul Katam, another really good guy I had who was a runner up in the 10 K at NCAAs and, and Chalima was talking about how, when they both went pro, they were going to run the Chicago marathon together and go one, two. And so, um, so I hear him now chirping a little bit about moving up to the marathon and I, <laughs> I always laugh and think about that. Not surprised. Yeah. yeah. Well, how's, how's, uh, you know, this past season for cross country, one of your tweets, uh, I always see your tweets, uh, Annika urban had a massive jump. She was what, like 220 something and was an all American I now. I think she was two sixty six her freshman year, which was, uh, the fall of 19 and then was 12th this year. Yeah. Unbelievable, wow. uh, drop, you know, what's that been like to work with someone who, you know, obviously could would qualify for a team's individual run or excuse me, you know, being on a team that made it to nationals, but now is an all American and seeing her progress. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's just been awesome watching her, you know, I mean, so that fall of 2019, she was a freshman and, you know, um, she was working hard, but she wasn't, anything spectacular. I think she made our nationals team because, uh, just because of an injury to somebody else. Um, and she ran, I want to say like 11, 15 or 11, 20 in the three K indoor that year. And, um, you know, I took her to the UAA meet knowing she wasn't going to score, but wanting to give her experience. And, um, she actually got dead last there and was, was not very happy about it afterwards. And, and, you know, I just told her, I was like, you're here because I believe in the future you're going to benefit from this experience because I think you're going to get good. And, and, you know, going to these meets early on in your career exposes you to it and, and you're more comfortable later. So, um, so, you know, we got shut down then um, for COVID and she went home and she just decided like, like many people who became good, she just decided like, I want this and I want to be good and I'm going to do what it takes. And so she just transformed herself over that shutdown and came back. And I think her first, uh, last spring, her first race, I think she went 10 Oh six, um, pretty much solo. So it was like, boom, you know, I'm here. So <laughs> it was pretty cool. So throughout COVID, how did your kind of role and approach as a coach change? Like, how did you adapt to that situation to stay hands on with the athletes and keep them motivated and everything? Yeah, it was kind of brutal. So, you know, we went home like I, like everybody else, right. Spring break in, in 20 and we didn't come yeah. back. And then in um, in the fall of uh, 2020, we we only brought our freshmen back to campus, um, and you know some upperclassmen came, lived off campus, and school was fully remote, and we were not allowed to practice 
um, I was not allowed to meet face to face with any of my athletes. So we went that whole fall semester, um, you know, not even getting to see each other. So I was basically just sending training to them and they were getting together. They were honing, like basically hosting their own practices. And, um, and we did that for a whole semester. We didn't get to practice until I think late February of 2021. And then oh, found wow. out a month later that we'd be able to compete outdoor. Um, and then found out, I think about two or three weeks before outdoor nationals that we were going to be allowed to travel to nationals. So it was, uh, you know, it was kind of interesting. It, it, you know, it, I think more than changing me, it changed the athletes that, you know, the, they became independent, they became motivated or not motivated. Right. And they kind of figured out like where running was in their life and, and what importance it held. Yeah. Let's talk about, you know, present day now, uh, hearing that you guys have had a tough time getting, coming back together. Now you're on the road again, as you said, you're, you're traveling for a meet and, and you're in a hotel right now, but uh, yeah, you know, one of the reasons we had you on, not just for your accolades, but for, you know, you speaking out about, uh, the time conversions. And so what we've, you know, looked into to make sure we're not coming, coming in here and be like, Hey, converting times angry, but you know, obviously it's, it's in the rule book that in 2010, this rule passed that in starting in 2012, 2013 season, wherever the national meet will be held, times will be converted. It is a scientific thing behind distances and which uh distance gets converted out and everything like that and so it begs the question and i'm glad we can have this discussion is knowing all of this knowing that if it is a flat track a banked or an oversized track gets converted down why is division three continually to have the national meets at uh, flat tracks, knowing that our TFERS list is going to look completely different than, you know, a D1 or a D2 list. So we'd love to hear your thoughts first and just, uh, yeah, we, we're kicking ourselves in our own foot there or whatever that yeah. saying is. Yeah. I, I think I should put a disclaimer in here. I, I'm from New York, so I tend to speak in some hyperbole and maybe tweet in it as well. So, you know, don't people out there, don't hold me exactly to exactly <laughs> what I say. All right. I, I may exaggerate a little bit, but and, and I and I do like to to uh, talk trash and I, and I rein it in for for the internet world. But um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, I got nothing against flat tracks. I get that you know a lot of people want to have the national championships on college campuses, and the tracks that D three schools have on their campuses are uh, are mostly flat. You know, so so I understand that. I get that. Um, you know, I, I don't know. I guess to me, it's just it just it doesn't make sense to dumb down times. Right. And so even if we're hosting on a flat track, why, why do we, why do we need to convert to that? You know, I mean, if, if we're converting the normal way, we're still going to get the best people most likely. Right. Um, and then, and then we host it there where we host it. But um, I don't know. I, I, I just, I hate seeing a guy run seven fifty five, and then, you know, you look on the list and, and it's eight flat and, you know, somebody I think tweeted back at me, like, who cares? you know, that's just the T first list, you know, if you go on the association page, but who goes on the association page? I mean, first of all, it's one of the worst websites, you know, out there. Like it's a horrible, like you just get the spinning wheel all the time and, uh, and nobody's diving deep enough to find where those records are on that page. Yeah. And then they're broken up and stuff like that. So, you know, T first is where people go and what they look at and they're seeing, you know, this poor kid runs 755 and he's on there at eight flat. And then he runs what? 356. And I think he, just barely snuck on yeah, that conversion. Um, I mean, the guy's like the ninth fastest miler all divisions right now, right? Yeah. Like what, you know, I mean, what are, what are we saying? Like come to D3, we'll make you slower. Like I, I don't, you know, yeah. I don't get it. Like it doesn't make sense to me. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I think some arguments were, I mean, even if D3 schools have majority flat tracks, uh, we... The, the goal should be to get the best people, as you said, to the national meet. And if you look at how the conversions are, sometimes you're more likely to have a guy who runs, you know, four twelve, four thirteen on the bank track get converted down and lose him to the national meet than you are if that were the inverse. I was going through; I don't have the exact statistics, but I was going through it to make sure I can make this argument that there is a case we made that when we do go to a flat track and times get converted backwards instead of forwards, we're losing more people to have run on a bank track. And uh, you know, the argue, 
people are going to say, well, bang track is obviously faster. Like, are, is he actually a four twelve guy? Look at Joe Freiberger, for example, this year, he goes and runs against some D one competition. The winning time was seven fifty nine. He runs eight eighteen. It gets converted back. And I think Spencer moon was in that race too. It gets converted back to like seven twenty three, seven twenty four, or something like that. Now fast forward, he runs eight twenty three in a flat track by himself wins by 21 seconds but now doesn't have any credit to that 818 because that 823 is faster than what his converted time was. Right. And he's going to be on the cusp of making the national meet now uh, because of these conversions. And so you got to question, you know, obviously I don't want to discredit anyone who wants to put on a meet, host a meet. I know that is crazy. National meet is tenfold that, but if there are certain facilities that can host a, a track meet and do it very well and has a bank track, why aren't we putting in bids there? I know Birmingham and Southern, uh, their Metroplex is going to host two times in the next five years. Mm-hmm. After 2026, let's keep going there. Like, let's keep going to these bank tracks so that way you don't have to have, you know, look at the Tiefers list and see like D1 never has to run into this. And I've been at a convention before where coaches make the argument, well, D1 does this. If this is the one thing we want to be like D1 for, let's go to national meets <laughs> or the bank track every year. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like I said, I I don't have anything against flat tracks and I I think there's some great ones out there and I think you can host good championships on it, but, um, yeah, I mean, I like banks. I mean, who doesn't like bank track, right? (laughs) Like, um, I mean, ask anybody who goes to one of those like crazy circuses at BU, like they're there maybe because it's 199 meters, but maybe just because it's a nice fast (laughs) bank track. I don't know. Um, but yeah, I mean, Crossplex is where we run most of our meets. It's two hours away from us. We are, yeah, like I said, I'm at a hotel right now because we're racing at JDL this weekend and, uh, it's basically the closest flat track to us. It's five hours away, five plus hours away. So, um, you know, it's, it's difficult for us to get a flat track. Um, it's, you know, and I, I get that, you know, the Midwest and Northeast, most of the D3 schools are there and, and flat tracks are all over the place there, but you know, bank tracks are popping up all over now too. Chicago's got a nice bank track. Uh, New York's got multiple bank tracks. Boston's going to have more bank tracks per capita than any other city in the world. Um, You know, I I think there's enough facilities now versus maybe in 2010, um, you know, where, where most D3 schools can get on bank tracks, um, you know, but anyway, I don't, you know, I'm not in, I'm not in a bank track versus flat track hosting uh, argument myself. I just, I just hate seeing, you know, I hate seeing kids lose credit for great times. You know, we had a kid, uh, this past weekend run four eleven at South Carolina on a bank track. And, you know, he's, he's converted up to like four fourteen. I mean, he's, he's going to be like on the bubble or on the outside looking in if he doesn't, if he doesn't improve that. Right. Do I think he's not a four eleven guy? I mean, I'm his coach, so I'm biased, but no, I don't think he's not a four eleven. I think he is. And like you said, I'd hate to see him miss out on a national championship meet just because we're surrounded by bank tracks. Right. And like you said, it's a lot of people. Yes. They only have flat tracks, but same thing you said, it, you got to travel five hours to give this kid a chance. And in college, especially you only get so many chances to run. So either way, there's always going to be, you're forced to travel to a bank or you're forced to travel to a flat. Um, but I did like the, I don't know if it, if this is what you're suggesting, but um, so regardless of where nationals is hosted, um, you think just eliminate the possibility of making time slower. Um, like if it's on banked or whatever, just always use the the conversion for like flat to banked. Yeah. Yeah. I think bank should be the standard no matter what. So yeah. even if we're hosting on a flat track, you know, banked is the standard that year for the times. And then, you know, right. those people that have the luxury of being on flats all the time, they're going to get a benefit. Their times will be made faster. And, you know, I'm cool with that. I don't, I don't see any yeah. problem with that. I just, you know, I don't know. I, I just, I just really hate seeing people like, and even if it's not yeah. affecting my people, like, you know, I was ranting about this before it affected anybody on my team. Just, I just hate seeing that. Like, come on, dude, ran 755 and 356. <laughs> like, that's ridiculous, right? Like, yeah. give them credit for it. Any high schooler that's looking at Williams and is going to be like, oh, let me yeah. go into first and see. They say they got a 356 guy and pops up T first because high schoolers know what T first are, right? And they're like, mm-hmm. oh, 
they don't have a 356 guy. They got a 359 guy. What are you talking about? Does it, that, yeah, that's been the that's, worst trying to trying to explain it to like my <laughs> friends who run D1 who are just sending me a tweet like, oh, I thought I thought he ran 356. Like my friends were at Boston. They're like, I thought he ran 356. Why does it say 359? I'm like, tune into the double. We'll, we'll let you know. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, my coaching friends in D1, they see my tweets and then they text me and they're like, what? This is so dumb. Why would they do this? And I'm like, I, I don't know. I have no idea why they do this. But yeah, I, I hadn't considered that. I just keep the the same conversion regardless. And then, yeah, because like you said, that is really cool for a school to be able to host it. And if they have a flat track, then yeah, wherever yeah. it's hosted, but just stop making time slower. I like I that. They get the best people to the meet. And I think it, you know, I mean, D3 is at a point now, like, you know, when I was in college, you know, everybody was talking about Carl Piranha. Like, you know, he was like the big name. He was the first guy to ever break four, whatever. Yeah. 356 dude now. Like, yeah. you know, like D3 is legit. There's, there's super legit runners and, you know, let's give ourselves credit for it. Let, let's let people know that there are legit people here. Carl, if you're listening, please reach out to us. We want you on the podcast, uh, back to the conversation. Uh, you know, hearing that the NCAA, you know, made this a rule, obviously with the way the convention works, we can, the coaches, the coaches can make this an amendment and bring it to the NCAA. You know, do you think you, we could, there's enough coaches out there that agree that regardless of where uh, nationals is held to always standardize the bank track for division three, just because of, you know, you look at the Tfers list on D one and it's nothing is going to be converted because they all have access to that. Yeah, that that's a good question. So, you know, I guess I don't really know enough D three coaches yet to be able to like gauge the temperature of the room. Um, you know, I'll have to call up Matt Burrow and, and, and ask him to, to do it for me since he, He's the guy that's always proposing the changes and knows knows all the um, <laughs> you know where people lie on on the voting. Um, but I mean, to me, I think it makes sense. I think you know, I think other coaches can see like, hey, you know, what this that this is a negative, you know, and and it doesn't have to. Why does it have to follow the track? Why can't we just have a standard? Like track and fields are already confusing enough for non track and field people. <laughs> But like, like, let's make a standard, like, let's keep this standard. Let's not have, you know, 2019 nationals is at Birmingham. So it's this, and you know, 2020 it's at JDL. So it's this, and then we're going to go back to Birmingham. It's going to be this and we're flip-flopping around it. It just, it doesn't make any sense. You're trying to explain to somebody because we hosted here, we did this, and because yeah. we, here, we did this. I can feel yeah. this is a standardized sport. Like, yeah, let's make it standardized. Yeah, no, that's a good point. Cause yeah, Agreed. a lot of Midwest schools, flat tracks, but then, yeah, like you said, they get a benefit from it because that way they don't have to go search out or they don't get, you know, a negative from it. I guess they would never get a negative from it running a flat track, but uh, yeah, I like that idea. If I had a flat track on my campus, I'd, I'd be all for it. I'd be like, yeah, vote. Like, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. bank's the standard. I'm going to get a convert, a positive conversion every time I host a home meet. I'd, you know, I'd love that. So, yeah. you know, I don't know if, I don't know if people out there think that or not. I'll probably hear on Twitter after the show. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. In the chat, if in the chat on Twitter, let us know your thoughts. Uh, if you listen to this on the podcast, uh, tweet at us. We'll retweet you. Let's get a in a well structured debate. Not debate. Let's have a conversation. <laughs> Let's figure this out and present it to the next coaches convention and get some stuff True. done. We need to yeah. host the coaches convention live on the double. Oh, <laughs> you don't want to see that. I bet it's, <laughs> you don't want to see that. Everyone Get goes to the convention our... for the, uh, for the, after all of that stuff, you know, we can just have everyone vote in the comments on new policies. Yeah. There we go. <laughs> Try to explain well, to people that haven't been there and uh, <laughs> whole nother can of worms. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for coming on and, and enlightening us with that idea. I think that is maybe better than always having a flat or a, a, a uh, bank track as the national host. We just standardize it and go from there. Yeah. yeah. Thanks for having me guys. Really appreciate it. For sure. Of course. Best of luck, best luck at Emory. Thank excited, you. Excited for the next Paul Chalimo out of Emory. What yeah. Are you gonna be? Excited to say. We'll see. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Coach. Bye.